Hello, I'm Diana Reif, the Artistic Director of the Charleston Literary Festival. I'd like to welcome our speakers, audience and donors. If the past four to 18 months has taught us anything, it is that books and their authors, whether classical or contemporary, really matter. In trying times, readers turn to books for insights into the human condition, for the opportunity to be transported to other worlds, for ideas, for arguments, for inspiration, for experiencing the impossible, for laughter, and for the release of tears. The festival will provide the opportunity to engage with a galaxy of literary and artistic stars, as well as up and coming writers who are making waves. We have a far flung cast list featuring authors from all over the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Whether they're talking about former literary trailblazers or gene editing or human rights or popular culture or feminism or medieval nuns or groundbreaking films or innumerable other subjects, they have one thing in common, the ability of compelling stories to linger in our imaginations. We're grateful to all our speakers, whether virtual or in-person, for sharing their talents. Please thank them by purchasing their books. The festival couldn't happen without a committed team and a board. We would like to thank our donors, both private and public, who generously make the festival possible. The College of Charleston, our academic partner, has been an invaluable source of support. It is no accident that the festival takes place in Charleston, a prime destination with a progressive literary and artistic tradition. I hope that you enjoy all the events and that they make you think and dream afresh. Hello, everybody. And I'm delighted to welcome Lauren Groff and her interlocutor, Regina Marla, to the festival to discuss Lauren's new novel, Matrix, a powerful story of sisterhood set in a medieval nunnery. Lauren Groff is the New York Times best-selling author of three novels, The Monsters of Templeton, Arcadia, and Fates and Furies, one of President Obama's favorite books of 2015, as well as the short story collections, Delicate Edible Birds, my favorite title for a collection <laughs> of short stories, and Florida. She's won several literary, literary awards, including the Paul Bowles Prize for Fiction, the Penn O'Henry Award, and the Pushcart Prize, and has been a finalist for the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Criti Circle Award, among others. In 2018, she received a Guggenheim Fellowship for Fiction and a fellowship at the Radical Institute, at the Radcliffe and Radical Institute <laughs> for Advanced Study. <laughs> Regina Marler is a non-fiction writer whose books include Bloomsbury Pie and Queer Beasts. She's edited the selected, selected letters of Vanessa Bell, who's the artist sister of Virginia Woolf, something that um, Lauren, uh, an author that Lauren and uh, Regina have in common, uh, their, their um, interest in her. And Regina writes critical essays for the New York Review of Books and elsewhere. So, prepare to be transported to a medieval utopia. I'm going to hand over to Regina and Lauren. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here again tonight in Charleston, this beautiful place. And yes. with Lauren, whom I've been reading since uh, you began, I, I can't remember where, but I'm pretty sure that I reviewed your debut. So I've been thank you for that. I'm sure you didn't read start. it. I don't read reviews, but thank you. I feel like <laughs> we know each other on social media, which yes. is not knowing each other. We lightly yes, connect. That's right. The years. Yes. Yes. Um, so Matrix, which is uh, an incredible novel, um, it's a uh, it's a retelling of the life of Marie de France, mm -hmm. and um, you make many interesting choices because we don't know much historically about Marie de France. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about some of those choices a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But I am interested that you chose the Middle Ages and, and uh, I've learned that your interest goes way back. In fact, one of your, uh, I think one of your earliest published stories 
It was a retelling of Eloise and Abelard. It was. Um, yeah. So, and, and interestingly, you didn't set it in the present day. You went back a little bit, and you set it during the 1918 pandemic, which, mm -hmm. of course, is probably relevant to what we're going through right now. Yeah. So, what is it about the Middle Ages? Where does that come from? So, uh, in college, I went to a tiny liberal arts college called Amherst, and it has, you know, 400 students per class. It's wonderful. I'm a massive introvert, and I hated seminars. And so, I would go to all of my professors starting sophomore year. I, f I figured out that professors really like it when you s stroke their egos. And I, um, I would go to them and say, I love your class. Could we do a tutorial, just one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> and a lot of times they'd say, yes. Um, so I, I had a whole year tutorial in medieval French, which was mm -hmm. the greatest series of classes. I, I wanted to be a medievalist up to the point that I applied for a fellowship at the Cloisters in New York City, and they rejected me, and then I didn't want to be a medievalist anymore. <laughs> Um, but I was so in love with courtly romance and the translation of a lot of these old texts, and I fell in love with uh, Marie de France, which, as you said, she's the first known female poet in the French language that we know of. I, I'm sure there are others. Anonymous was probably female, right? Um, but she's the one, and, she, and her lay got into me. It was a very deep splinter, and it's something that I wanted to play with for mm -hmm. the last over 23 years, so mm. I think, yes. Well, her work was hugely influential. And then we, we have it in translations from about you know, five or six other languages. Yes, yeah. So there was something about her voice. I mean, she was dealing with some familiar material, some Arthurian legend and other things, but Correct. there's something about her voice that's very powerful. And you have said that you uh, tried to translate a I little did. bit. I, I did. I didn't know if you did that because you thought there was something that you could get to that the existing translations didn't have, or if you did it later as part of your research for this to, as a kind of an immersive um, technique, a psychological immersion? Well, probably both. I, you know, I, it was probably a little ego-driven as well. I, I would like to be someone who does translations, but I have not found the text okay. that I want to really engage with. I also was doing it in the, the very antique rhythms, mm -hmm. uh, and it's all end rhymed, mm -hmm. and I think that's really hard to do con in contemporary English and mm -hmm. not make it sound really archaic and musty and, yeah. you know, right? So I just, I just never found the voice for it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing too was I, I did want to actually just sit with the text, engage with it in a, in a deeper way, and I thought that translation was the way to do that. Mm -hmm. But you have done work that I would describe as historical, but sort of slightly, like Arcadia, which yeah. is sort of, you know, begins in a kind of 70s commune, and sort of 80s, and then it has a, a, a more contemporary section. Um, what was the spark for Matrix? Yes. So I did carry with me for a very long time this love of Moët de France. Mm -hmm. But I was at um, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard. It's this amazing program where they invite people in all sorts of academic disciplines. So um, it, there were astrophysicists there, there were chemists mm -hmm. there, historians, sculptors, uh, video artists. And the whole purpose of this fellowship is for you to be in the room multiple times a week with people who have ideas. They're really incredible in their own disciplines, mm -hmm. but they have these wild ideas that are going to send your own research in spinning in different directions. So it's extraordinarily interdisciplinary in a way that I, because I'm a hermit and I'm a writer, all I do is sit at home and cry. Um, I don't get, get the opportunity to do this all that much. So this is beautiful, joyous celebration of idea. And we'd have um, a few lunches every single day, and then we'd, we'd go to our fellow fellows lectures. Mm -hmm. And for a while there, I was so excited by all of the yeah. ideas that I like, sure. it was like, just, I was, yeah a glass of champagne. I was just bubbling with them. Um, but, and actually, I, I still want to write a novel about black holes because there were a lot of people who are giving lectures on black holes and they are the most fascinating things on the planet. I don't know how to write a novel about that. Um, but uh, the, the night before I went to this lecture that actually blew my brain up, I was on a plane from Arizona 
And I, uh, I, I watched a classic movie, this 1939 film called The Women by oh, yeah. George Cougar. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all women. So yeah. good. And yeah. the only characters are women, yeah. right? The yeah. only characters in this film are women. But because, it, by the way, too, um, the screenplay was written in part by Anita Luce, who mm -hmm. wrote Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they have it at the bookstore. It's one of the funniest novels I've ever read in my entire life. It's so good. Um, anyway. So this, this film is all about, it's only women, but because it's made in 1939, these women only talk about men. So it doesn't even clear the Bechdel test. I was going right? to say, <laughs> it fail the Bechdel test. It just like trips over the lowest hurdle on the ground. Um, and so I was frustrated. I was frustrated mm -hmm. by the, the potential for this film that just never quite did the thing that I wanted it to yeah. do. The next day, I go to this lecture by my friend, Dr. Katie Bugis, and she's at Notre Dame. She's a medieval historian whose work is in the liturgies of nuns. And I went in thinking, eh, you know, liturgies <laughs> of nuns, I'm not all that interested. And she really, she exploded my brain um, because she was so passionate about these women and the way that they found ways of being uh, subversive within oh, the yeah. texts that they were using at the time. Yeah. And there's, she, she showed us this, this, um, this image that became one of the, the primary images in my book, which was um, only a few years ago, uh, archaeologists, uh, not archaeologists, um, anthropologists, mm -hmm. archaeologists mm -hmm. in uh, Germany discovered the jawbone of a, a nun, and in the teeth, in the dental plaque, it was lapis lazuli, uh, which is an incredibly expensive gem, and it's all found in one place in Afghanistan, and she was this medieval nun, and what they extrapolated from this vision of the, the dental mm -hmm. plaque was that the nuns at the time who were assumed to not touch these medieval manuscripts, right? Mm -hmm. To not be allowed to be yeah. involved in the creation of these manuscripts, where actually some of them were actually yeah. doing the painting because she would be licking the paintbrush and sort of painting the illumination. Grind it into right? a pigment. Yes. And she would yes. Dip, dip the pen. Dip the pen, yeah. lick it, yeah, dip yeah. it. So so that was this extraordinary yeah. moment where I thought, oh my goodness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Here's this Here's this subject, my, my love of Moïse de France, this, um, this idea that, uh, you know, when um, 2016 happened, I was like, I, I want to just found a lesbian separatist utopia, <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe I could make one in a book. And then, um, and then this idea came for me to actually talk about the contemporary mm -hmm. world through this slant-wise vision of it mm -hmm. in in the, the 12th and 13th century. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was almost like a secular vision happening uh, as Katie was giving her talk. It was fantastically fun. That do. never happens. <laughs> My novels never come to me like that. But yeah. you have, you've said that you like, um, uh, you like your historical novels to be like um, a, uh, it, 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 uh, to vibrate between the past and the present yes. like a tuning fork. Yes, that's and, exactly uh, right. And yeah. so you are, you do, you do read the, the past through the present, but more consciously than the kind of um, historical fiction that you, you read 50 years after the fact, you're like, oh, I can see that was written in the 30s. Right, yes, you know? yes. It was about yeah. the Middle Ages, but you can, yeah. you can see. But this is, this is different, this is very conscious. Yeah, it's very conscious. Uh, something, I, I think about this a lot, because I think that there is a large amount of snobbery in literary fiction against historical fiction. There right? is. I mean, it's, it's immense. Mm -hmm. I think it's partially because of the fact that a, um, a, there are a great many romance novels set in the past, yeah. and I think that's bled into mm. this sort of a snob, snobbish feeling mm -hmm. by literary writers and critics about it. Um, and Henry James even, you know, Henry James hated historical fiction. He, uh, Sarah Orne Jewett, who's a great writer, she wrote The, the um, Country of Pointed Furs, um, mm. he had praised her work, and so she thought, that she would send him her historical novel in in progress, and he wrote back this letter that you can find online. It is the the, the most crushing letter that you can imagine, because he's you know he's Henry James, and he's he's so articulate about how uh, basically historical fiction is 
something that is just corrupt from the beginning mm. because you could not possibly even try to create the mindset of the people of the times. Therefore, verisimilitude is not even on the table. When, yeah. Right. So yeah. I, I was bearing a lot of that, um, yeah. you know, like imposed shame. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then I realized that actually, first of all, there's no such thing as a historical fiction, right? There's no such <laughs> thing yeah. as fiction that. Uh, is not talking about yeah. at least the time that it's being composed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, novels are made of time. It's time, character, and words all mixed together. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, people are writing historically whether or not they, they're aware of it. And you can use the past as a way of speaking back and forth. It's actually making a tunnel between times and, mm -hmm. and trying to see the, the mm -hmm. roots of how we got to where we are. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's trying to, to speak back and forth and, and trying to understand human nature, which is one of the great projects mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. fiction. So it's, I, I, I came around eventually to the understanding that one can do interesting work in historical fiction, for sure. I think that now that we, I mean, the example of Hilary Mantel comes to mind, yes. obviously, the, yeah. the tremendous you know, success of those books aesthetically and professionally and so forth, and it's really opened people who might have otherwise had this modernist bias mm -hmm. against um, historical fiction. I remember when I was a young writer, there was a, a Xerox circulating that, um, among, among young publishing interns. And what had happened is, this is a big secret, but um, I'm sharing it with you now, <laughs> but Jeanette Winterson had received a, a flyer in the mail, like you sometimes do, and this was, this, this was from a company that was doing a who's who in historical fiction writers. And they sent it to Jeanette Winterson because of some of her subject matter. And she, being Jeanette Winterson, she took a big fat magic marker and she wrote back, I am not a crap historical novelist. Oh. I'm an experimental writer. And she actually sent it back. <laughs> so when this blistering document yeah. <laughs> reemerged from the facts, you, 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 you know, you get this thing out. Um, it was, you know, it was suppressed, obviously, but it was quietly Xeroxed and spread around for years. It oh was so great. Goodness. It was so characteristic of her. Yeah, um, she definitely writes historical fiction. Right? <laughs> she <just> writes <laughs> historical fiction. She's fascinated by the yeah. past yeah. and its effects on the present. Yeah. One of the things you do, or you're able to do in this book, but I think in all your work now, is um, you're addressing your environmental concerns mm -hmm. too. And mm -hmm. Middle Ages, we think of it as a period when there was such abundance, there was such plenty, amazing resources, forests, and so forth that we've been despoiling for you know many centuries since. But already by the Middle Ages, you know, uh, Greece had been deforested, you know, so they were familiar with some of those ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you've got a, um, a situation in which the powerful um, young abbess, uh, Marie de France, you put her into this abbey and you've given her um, the capacity to change the world around her mm -hmm. to match her, her, her dreams and visions. And mm -hmm. her, um, she has a plan to protect the abbey by building, for example, a, a, a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is earthworks. Yes, yeah, right. And from her perspective, she's thinking, you know, I'll just move this forest around. But really, that's quite a, a we regard it as a destructive act, you yeah. know. And you and you have that. You've got. Um, I hope I can find this passage. But um, you've got. She she passes through the labyrinth, you know, after. Um, after it's complete, she's kind of proud of, of herself. But as she does see for a moment her vast sin for which she will be punished because she has pressed it into the labyrinth. This once pure gift of the Virgin, her hunger for her name to rebound in fame three times. It's a sin of pride. It goes on and she's, she's um, a horse rounding a, a bend and she's, she laughs at her fear. And she believes she's been released from her sins. What she does not see behind her is the disturbance her nuns have left in the forest. The families of squirrels, of dormice, of voles, of badgers, of stoats, who have been chased in confusion from their homes. The trees felled that held green woodpeckers, the pine martens, the missile thrushes, and the long-tailed tits, the woodcocks, and caper calies, I don't know how to pronounce that, chased from their nests the willow warbler vanished in panic from these lands for the time being. It will take a half century 
to lure these tiny birds back, she sees only the human stamp upon the place. She considers it good. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really wonderful and very subtly done. <laughs> it's not, you know, uh, a heavy-handed thing. Mm -hmm. How, you've said that you feel that it's a, a moral imperative for you now. Yeah. To talk about things it in is. That way. It is a moral imperative for me. Um, I, um, I, every writer has their own stance uh, with mm -hmm. the urgencies of the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, if I'm not somehow thinking about the largest, most existential issue that's facing humanity, yeah. which yeah. is climate change, uh, I am doing a disservice to, to people because I what I'm what I'm doing is I'm I'm asking you to engage in escapism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't want to engage in escapism I think that that is amoral yeah. I think um, to, to to attend mm -hmm. to an urgency is a moral act attention mm -hmm. is a moral act mm -hmm. um, so I I have been trying to think through how one does talk about climate change in the 12th century because that is not a perception of what mm -hmm. is happening but in reality, in truth, where there's a human being yeah. interacting with nature, there's going to be climate change. It's, mm -hmm. it's maybe not catastrophic. It's maybe yeah. not I increasing. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the Middle Ages, they were, um, they were deforesting all mm -hmm. of Europe, yeah. basically, at the time. But, uh, not to the levels that we see today. But I, I did want to, to think through some, some, some moral issues. And some mm -hmm. of those moral issues were, for instance, um, I think if we think of climate change as something that has started or increasing since the 70s, then we're doing a profound disservice to mm -hmm. the, the resolute nature of life itself to rebound if we just help it, yeah. right? So I, I think it's very, very easy to fall into despair and to turn mm -hmm. aside and to not look at what we're doing if we think that there's no way to stop it. Yeah. But the truth is life wants to live, right? Mm -hmm. Life wants to go and actually bloom and thrive and become vibrant and, and large, and all we have to do is really just pay as, as close attention as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And there are times in human history that we have brought things back from the yeah. brink. So I, I think um, is situating climate change in a larger human um, idea of time is, is a, a thing that can get us out of our lassitude and our despair. Um, but the other thing too is, I, um, I don't, I, I, I would not be able to live with myself. And I think that often there's this negotiation when one is writing between uh, speaking to the reader and then doing the, the utmost ethical act one can do, which is, as I as said, the act of attention, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. so it's this balance here, too. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this book, Matrix, is mm -hmm. the first in a projected uh, triptych. It's not a trilogy, yeah. it's a yeah. triptych. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, like Hieronymus In the Bosch, medieval form, right? like, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, where none of the the subject matter is shared, mm -hmm. none of the characters mm -hmm. are shared, none of the, even the language is shared. But they're really thinking about the way that um, structures, hierarchical mm -hmm. structures of religion, for instance, mm -hmm. and, um, and the way that humans are bound within these structures does have an effect upon the world, the natural world. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first one is Matrix, 12th century nuns. The second one is 1609 in Jamestown. Uh, this was the book that I was actually writing at Radcliffe, and then Matrix came, like, took over. Um, but this one is uh, very Elizabethan. It's got a very Elizabethan language. It's, it's mm -hmm. basically a Robinson Crusoe, but a woman lost in the wilderness sort of story, sort of an inversion of the captivity narratives mm -hmm. of the time. Um, and then the third one is uh, now. So it, it, mm -hmm. what I what I want what I want to do is sort of trace the ideas of God, climate change, women, and mm -hmm. religion, and all of the mm -hmm. way that they they circle and they mm -hmm. they speak to each other. And I find each of these books are talking back through time, yeah. talking forward through time, and trying to to have a conversation, a much mm -hmm. larger conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's the other reason why um, that was in this book as well too, because it's part of a larger uh -huh. discussion that's happening over the course of multiple books. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, it is good then. I mean, it's, it, it's good for a variety of, of narrative reasons that, that you have given Marie de France the kind of power beyond her literary power because um, we know so little about her. That, basically, we know that she was an educated woman and she probably had multiple languages. Mm -hmm. She was writing a dialect of old French. It was mm -hmm. Anglo-Norman, Anglo so she had some kind of connection to England, mm -hmm. and um, she was maybe somewhere around the court of Henry II. This, these are things that we can surmise from her work, and there isn't a lot of, of personal information in her work, basically her name and you know, where she's from. Mm -hmm. So you could have made her a courtly lady. Uh, yes, yes. But you didn't. <laughs> I could have made her, so one of, the, one of the ideas that historians have is that she was actually one of Eleanor Bagleton's daughters from mm -hmm. her first marriage to Louis Setz, um, when she was mm -hmm. the queen of the French and not the queen of the English. Um, and that Marie was a wonderful person. Right? She, was, she was very elegant. She was very uh, magnificent. She, she, she promoted a lot of arts and a lot mm -hmm. of literature at the, at the time. But I wasn't interested in that. Yeah. that was, I, I, I really was interested in the, the alternate vision of Marie mm -hmm. um, as an abbess. Yeah. Uh, I love enclosed spaces for my mm -hmm. characters. I love mm -hmm. um, utopian experiments. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. an abbey is nothing more than a utopian experiment. I mean, it's a lot yeah. more than a utopian yeah. experiment. But it's definitely utopian. Um, and I, I really wanted my Marie to be both insider and outsider. Mm -hmm. She had to be both things at once. Yeah. Because if she was going to expand, and I saw her throughout the course of the book before I even wrote it, as this bubble constantly growing, growing, growing. Part of it was her mm -hmm. ambition, part of it mm -hmm. was her, her larger than life personality, part of it was mm -hmm. her um, spirituality. Everything was just mm -hmm. growing larger and larger. Mm -hmm. Then she had to have uh, uh, it's sort of an insider, both mm -hmm. uh, insider and outsider perspective mm -hmm. of the world. She mm -hmm. had she had to be yeah. educated. She had to be noble because mm -hmm. the only women at the time who were educated were noble women. Yeah. They had to mm -hmm. step forward, take care of the huge, vast estates while the men were off killing mm -hmm. Saracens, yeah. um, right, and each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was this uh, this idea of her as being a misfit, so, um, a misfit within. Mm -hmm. Every single aspect, she was not comfortable being a woman uh, or being a woman uh, with a really rigidly defined gender roles mm -hmm. at the time. She wasn't comfortable in um, the intellectual cage she was put mm -hmm. into or even the religious cage she was put into. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wasn't comfortable... She, she was just an uncomfortable human, right? Yeah, like she, yeah. she, in her own physical form, she was very much an animal in a way that mm -hmm. I, I think at the time women were not really supposed to be. Yeah. So uh, she's she's big, she's large, she's she wanted to fight everyone. Um, so so with this book, I wanted this person to be liminal in a lot of ways, and I wanted to mm -hmm. talk about. Um, all sorts of things, like the, yeah. the, the problems of growth, of uh, almost capitalist growth, which mm -hmm. is happening within yes. uh, uh, this abbey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's a, yes, I, I think I answered your question. Oh, I should, I, should, I should have you read now, <laughs> because you have an excerpt oh, yeah. ready, don't you? Okay, so, yeah. yeah, you want me to read? Okay, Please do, all please right. do, and then we'll, we'll see where it goes from Excuse there. Excuse me. All right, so, um, hi, this is very short. All right, is this all right? <laughs> Hi, Diana. Um, okay, so this part is a part where Marie is only 17 years old. She has been um, kicked out of her family estate. And uh, in the book, it's intimated, and I'll, well, we can explain why, that she is uh, the illegitimate sister of Henry II. And so the mother of Henry II is Empress Matilda, who, if you look her up, she is a phenomenal human being. I love her so much. Um, she's, she's one of these, like, warrior queens. Um, and she, uh, she, was, she was not expected to become Queen of England uh, because she was a woman. Her brother died in a boating accident. Um, they instituted her cousin, who's sort of this measly little man, in her role. And so she spent her entire life trying to fight for England. 
Um, and then, so here we are, and Queen Matilde, Matilda is very, is, is old, and she's sort of in her retirement. Okay. Too soon, they come to a hunched, suspicious, leering city. The entrails of some large animal glisten purple in the street, guarded by an enormous cur showing its teeth. The palace of the Empress Matilda and the royal park of Kivi, frightfully small, overly neat. Inside, the wall hangings were moth-chewed, the furniture thick and dark. The empress rustled in at last after long waiting, a dried-up husk of a woman with tiny features squeezed into the center of her face. In the days when Eleanor had hopped from the bed of France to the bed of England, it was this empress, Eleanor's new mother-in-law, Marie's almost nothing of a stepmother, who instructed the queen and the subtler statecraft needed. Marie felt astonishment that such a tiny trembling woman could have led armies, courted allies, been crowned in both Rome and London, withstood sieges, crossed frozen rivers on foot to keep herself from conceding to defeat. A hard wind could have somersaulted her like a leaf. A sneeze could have. Empress was what Marie would call her, the old lady said without asking Marie to sit. Not stepmother, never stepmother. She was in no way a relation of Marie's, and yet here the girl was, bastardess made of rape. Well, the empress did not hold bastardry against a person. Some of the best people were bastards. Most of her own siblings, in fact. The best of her siblings, in fact. She did, however, begrudge the money spent, which she did not want to spend, did not ask to spend, and had to spend, for she was the only one with any money at all at the time of the well, the violation. At first, when Marie's mother wrote asking for aid for when she was dead and gone, the empress thought she would keep Marie with her, but now that Marie was here, she was quite glad she would not. Such a great rustic with leaves in her hair and a stink that frankly affronted. Come closer so she could look, the empress said. No, she must stand in the light, turn toward the empress. Oh, bless her, sweet mother of God. Marie would not do it all, would she? Not at all, so tall it was frankly obscene. Three heads taller than any woman should be, crown brushing the beams, bony as a heron. Flap those wings and take to the skies. No, it was right Marie was going over to Angleterre, which, to be perfectly clear, if not for the Empress, would be a country entirely lost, the wild pigs and the uh, Celts and the devil. The Empress was the one to have saved that awful place. No, no, in her old age, she could never have kept Marie or taught her to be a lady, exposed as she had been to those famous unwomanly ants, those horrors. How fortunate that at the Empress's daughter-in-law, Eleanor, oh, she would civilize Marie, quick, quick, she would not abide a rube. She would slap lily root powder on that face and line those eyes and put that awful body in decent dresses. Marie did swim in those awful old dresses. She looked simply ridiculous. What a waste of fine blood. What a waste of the blood shared by the Empress's own children. No, Marie had nothing of her siblings save for the jaw, perhaps, and the height, and the nose, and the forehead, and the hair, and perhaps those <laughs> eyes. Never, Marie would never make an advantageous marriage. It was hopeless to imagine Marie in jewels, a scarecrow dressed up impossible. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, she said, she must order wine to recover and a great deal of it. This child looked as though she could eat three cows, snout to tail, and still have room for a goose. The empress shouted at the door to bring food and more of it than one thought. Four hearty souls could eat. Irritatedly, she asked why Marie was standing. Marie sat. A long silence of waiting and the log crackled in the fireplace. At last, the empress said into the silence that perhaps she had been hasty and she had given it more thought, and who knew? Why should an old empress say what was possible and impossible in this world? Perhaps Marie would dazzle some fool. No telling what strange tastes existed in the world. Oh, she could tell some tales of pairing she had seen, that Clotilde, with a hog's face and a hump on her back, become a sudden duchess. Duchess for a hump-backed hog face. And so on. Perhaps Marie would marry and bear a great brood of nobles. Marie did have in her veins the blood of the fairy Melusine, after all, as did her siblings. And they all had a magic to them that was visible, something under the surface shining, like moonstone. Marie, too, shone with it. 
the Empress now saw that wicked underglow. And the more the old lady's eyes were accustomed to Marie's face, although she was, of course, entirely devoid of beauty. In fact, she was quite, quite ugly, really rather remarkably ugly. She could see that those eyes of Marie's were not at all ugly. They were full of fire. And that was not nothing, that inner fire. Oh, what a pity for Marie that she was born a woman, though not a pity for her own children, of course. No, no, she was quite glad for her own children's sake. The table was set, the servant withdrew, they ate. With her mouth full, the empress said suddenly that she forgot Marie was a recent orphan. Well, the empress was an orphan too. It was most lonely to be an orphan. Marie's mother had little to admire in her, but she was persistent. She at least made the family agree to take Marie. Marie said quietly that her mother was the best of women. The empress hissed in displeasure and bits of chewed bread sprayed at Marie. She said quickly that Marie's mother was indeed not at all the best of women. Oh no, they were far, far better. But she was fine, at least fine for a ruined woman. Fetching in her maidenhood even. So fetching, she seduced one who couldn't belong to her. Yes, well, perhaps not seduced. Although it is true that a woman's blood is often hotter. Everyone knows this. Eve's sin was that of passion. No, Marie's mother's fault was that she was fetching and a fool, for she didn't run fast enough. The empress was fetching too. There were songs about her beauty, but at least she wasn't a fool. She knew how to run fast. She ran very fast, and no one caught her, and therefore she was not violated, not even once. Despite Marie's ugliness, the empress hoped the girl knew that it could happen to her. Perhaps it was not beauty, but rather power that stirred the blood. The empress said she hoped Marie was more like herself than her mother. She hoped Marie knew how to run fast, fast. The empress waited. Marie said very slowly that she did indeed run quite fast. Marie could not possibly run as fast as the empress, the old lady said, eyes bright. And Marie had the dizzying sensation that the ancient empress wanted to be challenged to a foot race. Out in the torchlit streets of Rouen, skirts gathered up, the dirt road dark drawn swift beneath. Marie would have been beheaded for winning. Marie said that no, it was true, she was surely not as fast as the empress. The empress smiled. She was glad Marie had some diplomacy in her, a nice thing to discover. Oh, well, fine, she would help Marie. She was surprised to find she did not dislike the girl, though, to be frank, she fully expected to hate the very face of her. But no matter, she would provide an armed escort across to the court of Angleterre. This is what she could do for the girl, though she'd already done quite enough. Marie said, thank you, but her servant and she could make their way across the channel alone, after all, they'd found their way to Juan all alone. The empress laughed girlishly, and Marie now saw that she had lost her central teeth upper and lower, and her molars were black at the hearts with decay. Foolish girl, the empress said. Now it was known everywhere that she'd been the guest of the empress, that she was blood relation to the crown of Angleterre. Though she was nothing at all to look at, still she was worth some kind of ransom, that or a forcible marriage, as conduit to bring some family closer to the throne. What a child Marie Steele was to not understand this. Marie breathed in and out and thanked the empress humbly for her protection. The empress said, standing that, well, to kin of kin, perhaps some kindness was owned, owed. She laughed at her own quip and said suddenly that now she must toddle off to sleep. She gave Marie a slap of affection on the cheek with her dry, small hand. Then, with a rustle of silk and a smell of moth herbs, the empress was gone. This is the last Marie saw of this woman, great by birth, greater by marriage, greatest in offspring, or so her stone in the Rouen Cathedral will read after she goes to her eternal reward. Okay, thank you. A, a lot of people have written about your, your sensual prose. Mm -hmm. yeah, you use a lot of sensory images. And we have a shared love of Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. um, and she, uh, she had this formulation, this, this well-known formulation about granite and rainbow that both were, were needed in fiction. So you've got the, the granite of uh, these facts you have to convey. You have to, for the reader, you, know, you have to um, 
build this world for them. Mm -hmm. You know, who, who is Marie within this, uh, within this hierarchy? Who are these people? What are their, uh, what's their importance? And, and how do they affect her life? And mm -hmm. so forth. And then you have um, the smells and <laughs> the, the taste and the textures and the, the glimpse of the teeth and mm -hmm. so forth. It's, uh, it's, it's very good. Uh, in that you, you get that complete uh, experience. It's, uh, you know, it's like being in the room. Um, I know that you've, you've written about your, your first drafts as being something you, you quickly do, mm -hmm. uh, longhand. Mm -hmm. um, do those kind of sensory images come to you soon, early in that process? Mm -hmm. Or do they come at the end after you've established what's you know, a, a rather complicated 12th century world? Yeah, so uh, I... I cannot write out of anything but my body. So, mm -hmm. so the, I am from a family of particularly women who are, are animals like Marie. Right? <laughs> We're very, very, we have to run at least an hour a day or else we, um, our brains go a little bit wrong. Um, and the way that we take in information is through the body. And so for me, every time I sit down, to, to compose something, mm -hmm. and it, it could be the first draft or the eighth draft, mm -hmm. uh, I have to first experience it basically through the body or through my sensory understanding of what is happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. So before I start to work on any given particular scene, I will stop, I'll close my eyes, and then I'll just try to, to put myself into the scene in a sensory mm -hmm. way as deeply as I possibly can. It's almost like meditation okay. in a certain yeah. way. So yeah. with every draft, it's one of those things where I remember what had happened before and then it adds mm -hmm. something, something about life or living between yeah. the drafts adds more texture or more information to the, to the mm -hmm. sensory scene, the somatic mm -hmm. scene that's actually happening mm -hmm. within my understanding of the body at the moment. Yeah. yeah. As part of your research process, I know that you went to stay at at least one um, Benedictine Abbey. Yes. So you're surrounded by nuns. Um, what were you? What kind of preconceptions did you have going in, or you were just open to everything? And then what did you discover? Oh, I was very open. Uh, but of course, my understanding of nuns was at that point I'd done a great deal of research. I had. Uh, one of the other great things about um, Radcliffe is that you, they give you Harvard students to be research assistants. Oh, it's fun. Awesome, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're just like, go to the library and find me a manuscript and they yeah. will come back with a photocopy. It's amazing. Wow. Um, so I did a great deal, what they did, and I did also a great deal of research. Um, so my understanding of nuns is med medieval, I, right? I, I believed, right, yeah. that I was I was coming to this place. I went um, just for a few days to this place in Connecticut called uh, Regina Laudis, which is possibly one of my favorite places on the planet. And uh, in the Benedictine rule, it's very, very important that hospitality is extended to, to mm -hmm. guests. And so they have this guest house, multiple guest a, a female guest house and a male mm -hmm. guest house. And... Um, the nuns feed you this beautiful handmade bread and soup. It's so good. And you get to go work with the nuns in, within the enclosure. And I, um, when I pulled up tomato plants, it was November's dead tomato plants. And then I, the next day, I chopped wood with the nuns. It was so That's fun. Right. Um, so it was, it was this, this wonderful experience where I, had, I was living within time. I was living within my researched understanding mm -hmm of medieval nuns and sort of the cycle of time then, mm -hmm. and then whatever I could glean from mm -hmm. modern day nuns. And of course, um, a lot of the rhythms of mm -hmm. Abbey life are very similar. I mm -hmm. mean, you do stop in your day to pray many times a day. Yeah. Um, they do. Um, and, and the singing, the, the sort of the a cappella mm -hmm. singing of psalms was very mm. similar too. Yeah. There are a lot of immense differences as well. I mean, mm. they're, they know how to work phones, right? <laughs> like, uh, you know, and, and clocks and yes. their mirrors, right? They're, they're actually like modern technologies. Um, but it was this, this extraordinary uh, mixture when I was there. I was, I was trying to see something underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the work that goes into writing fiction is not necessarily the work that actually mm -hmm. shows up in the book. It's the stuff that gives weight to what it does end yeah. up showing up in the book. It's, it's yeah. all of the, the, mm -hmm. the force behind the 
the points yeah. of the words as they appear on the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the relationships between the women are, yeah. are incredible in, in the book. And um, I think it's the uh, it's part of the Benedictine rule. I think the phrase is no particular friendships. Yeah. Is that the phrase? Yeah. So you're not really supposed to form special friendships with mm -hmm. one particular person. But of course, such things are inevitable. Yeah. And yeah. There, there are such friendships. Um, but Marie's great love is not among those. I mean, she has favorites. They tend to arise and, and drop away. Mm -hmm. But over the many, many years that she's at the Abbey and rising in power and managing this, you know, these immense estates, and, and she, when she enters, the, it's very poor. Mm -hmm. And when she leaves, it's this magnificence, mm -hmm. maybe the best in Europe. Uh, um, but in the course of that, her great love is actually um, Eleanor of Aquitaine. So you get a chance in this way to... Um, to have this thread of yearning mm -hmm. throughout the book for mm -hmm. this uh, this glorious, you know, queenly and beautiful, I mean, for Angevin women, she was, she was incredibly attractive. Oh, yeah. yeah um, okay. and, and yet, um, also you get to play with the uh, medieval idea of courtly love, mm -hmm. yes. which would otherwise not really come in yeah. to something so, into the cloister. Right. So right. it's a terrific way to, to, to pull that in. Oh, I mm. love courtly, uh, uh, narratives of courtly love at mm. the time, right? And yeah. Yes. So courtly love um, is this sort of substructure of, about love that did appear at the time and was, um, was basically nurtured by Eleanor Rakuten's court. Mm -hmm. And there are these very rigid rules about what love is. So at the time, of course, marriage um, should not have contained cupidity, right? Or it should not mm -hmm. have contained lust mm -hmm. because that would have been sin. But uh, so love was actually between people who would not have been married to one another, right? Which is adultery, <laughs> right? Um, and there's, if you actually look this up, there, there actually, um, there's a, a text that gives about 31 rules of courtly love, and they're all fascinating. But one of the things is, um, love is either um, waxing or waning at any mm -hmm. given moment. Uh, love is, um, marriage is no impediment, I have this one. Love is, is sort of at a distance. Um, mm -hmm. The loved one, you, you know, there, there are just so many rules yeah. about it. Yeah. And it's this extraordinary, uh, almost uh, subversive way mm -hmm. of looking at the world that mm -hmm. Marie takes into herself in the court of Eleanor mm -hmm. of Aquitaine. And it becomes the, the dominating um, romantic idea in her life. And, and she needs to have this distant relationship, this distant idealized mm -hmm. love of Eleanor of Aquitaine in order to sort of work against her and toward her and then um, often, and then sometimes to take her in as a friend and, mm -hmm. and um, a foil too at the same time. So yeah, yeah the, over the course of the book, the relationship between them waxes and wanes and, and is, is predicated on the, the idea of courtly romance. Yeah. yeah. She starts to have this fantasy toward the end that she's going to... Um, build a beautiful building, and, and Eleanor will choose to come there in retirement, which is something that a lot of noble women did. Eleanor did, uh, yeah, and, and she, and she ended up yeah. doing, doing yeah. so, but but differently, not you know, not here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is. Um, but she's at once again, you know, poor Marie gets checked in her, you know, her desires. She's, you know, she gets this, you know, she describes this beautiful building, and she's like, come closer, Eleanor, and Eleanor <laughs> says, I don't think so, you know, if you're. If your Abby really gets that rich, I might have to increase your taxes. <laughs> and that's, 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 right. that's the answer she gets. That's right, yeah. 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 Well, the, before we go to some questions, I want to point out that uh, your book has been nominated for a National Book Award. You're shortlisted, yeah. and I think we are about four days from Wednesday. I know. Constant. It's Wednesday. So, I have the yes. most amazing dress. I know it's just virtual. <laughs> Uh, it's it's just on a screen, but like the last, so this is my third book that's a finalist, which is a wonderful mm -hmm. honor. But the previous two times, there's this huge party in Cipriani's mm -hmm. in New York mm -hmm. City, and you right, it's yeah. so much fun. Yeah. You get to dance, you get to wear the medals, and this year because it's virtual, like I'll be dancing by myself. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I was like, I might as well just buy the most amazing gown. So I bought the most amazing gown, and I'll be wearing Fantastic. it alone. <laughs> in my house. 
<laughs> with the metal very heavy around my neck. Your family yeah. drinking champagne. No, so I'm, I won't even be with my family. Oh, I, have no. to, I have to give a I have to give a series of lectures at Notre Dame, so I'll be alone. <laughs> You'd be in the <laughs> faculty <laughs> housing or something at Notre Dame, wherever they put you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm sorry so, to hear it. It'll be fine. That's <laughs> no, true. At least it'll look amazing. To yes, you'll look fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, I know that we have some questions, so I would like to ask you to formulate brief questions. We have two people with microphones that will be circulating through the audience. And um, yes, raise a hand. Ask anything. And speak up, please, because I'm. Yeah, I'm, I don't know that much about you, but I thought it would be nice to know what your childhood was like. Where were you born? What was your family like? Because you're an amazingly um, um, colorful writer and gifted person. Thanks. That's very nice. Um, <laughs> I'm from a tiny little village in upstate New York called Cooperstown, which is where Baseball Hall of Fame. I usually make a joke, and it's actually where Glimmer Glass Opera is as well. Um, my, so my parents were both first generation college students. Uh, I have an older brother who's a doctor. My younger sister is a two time Olympian in triathlon. Mm -hmm. um, and we were very much raised with, under the edict of uh, super benign neglect, like very <laughs> loving benign neglect. So it's, I mean, my parents fed us, but we were allowed to do, <laughs> Anything we wanted. Uh, and so in the summers, of course, the only thing I wanted was to read. And so I would just read all day long until I got ill from reading. <laughs> my sister, all she wanted to do was swim. So she did. <laughs> um, and my brother, I don't know, like, like lit fireworks and like <laughs> tormented the dog. I don't, I don't even know what he did. Um, so uh, yeah, so it was a really kind of idyllic, wonderful life. Mm. Uh, Cooperstown, after the tourists are gone, it has one stoplight and no movie theaters. Uh, it's really tiny. And so it's wonderful training for mm. a writer because the only thing that you have around you are the people and their relationships mm. between the people. And so you see how yeah. one infidelity ripples through a community, right? And you can see the way that other marriages start to fall and things happen mm. to the kids, and right? So you, you begin to understand the really small um, interpersonal connections and the way that everyone is, is related in a, a web, a, a, a network, a social network. Mm. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you, that's good. I have no filters, <laughs> so I will answer anything. <laughs> Probably not the way you In the back, okay, good. on the, my left, thank you. I can only imagine the next question. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. It's been so lovely to hear, um, hear you both talk. Um, I'm fascinated by the fact that you write in longhand, mm -hmm. especially in an increasing technological age when we live in pixels on our screens and um, live so virtually. I'd love to hear kind of what that practice means for you, what that looks like, just given yeah, how virtual everything else is. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, um, I can only write my first many, many, many drafts longhand. And uh, one of the reasons is because the women in my family are animals, right? And so I think the, the reason that I love longhand so much is that I can smell the ink and the paper, right? I can actually engage with the feel of the ink and the paper. Oh, stop right there. What paper? Okay. What pen? So I'm very, I'm very, it's very, very Let's get granular. Um, I love, there's a Japanese um, uh, stationery store mm -hmm. called Muji, and they have these huge notebooks that are actually, they're meant to be drawing pads, but I, I, the paper's very, very thick. And they're really large, um, so that you can actually fit something like 5,000 words to a, a page if you write really tiny, the way that I do wow. in, in, indecipherably. Mm -hmm. um, and so the pens, I like the pens right now just because mm -hmm. they're really super fine points and mm -hmm. they slow me down. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons too that I, I write longhand is because it just slows you way down so that mm -hmm. uh, you can actually 
think through multiple sentences as you're still working on this one and, and constantly be revising the way that you're, you're pushing your work. Uh, another thing too is I hate computers. Um, it's both parts of my family have uh, very strong Mennonite roots and I think I like, I just, I hate electricity. Um, but I also, physiologically, if you're, if you're watching the way that one works on a laptop, it, you're pushing away sort of your work and in, in, mm. it, it's always at a slight distance. Your arms are extended. The screen is, is sort of like a stop sign right in front of you. And the cursor and, and the, 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 the words on the screen almost look as though they're, they could be printed, right? And so it tricks you into believing that it's closer to being finished than it actually is. Whereas mm -hmm. when yeah. you're working with longhand, I cannot actually, I legitimately cannot read my own handwriting. Um, and that is good because I'm a perfectionist. Um, so if I were to be able to read my own handwriting past maybe two minutes after writing it, I would constantly be going back and, and like fixing the things and constantly going back, going back, going back instead of pushing on and getting through the first, second, third, eighth draft. Uh, but what it does is I don't ever go back to the previous drafts. I never reread them. I set them to the side and in that interstitial moments, the gap between drafts, everything that is not living in that, that first draft um, goes away, right? Mm. So I'm not fixated on, on things that sort of stroke my ego, things that I would, would have kept in the book that are not living, but they're very pretty. Mm. Um, those things die, and the next mm. uh, attempt with a fixed substructure, architecture, mm -hmm. characters, understanding of the world, all of that stuff comes in. And if it, it's meant to be in the book, it will survive between drafts. And I have mm -hmm. a great deal of faith in that leap between the mm -hmm. first, second, second, third. And actually, the, the, the moment of silence in between is very, very important for the, the writing of the book. Sort of the, the catharsis of, of throwing everything out and starting over again. Mm -hmm. It's really, that's my favorite point, actually. Because you come back to the platonic ideal in the middle, right? You're like, well, maybe I could write a perfect book. <laughs> uh, and then you fail. And then you could do it again, maybe. And then you fail again. So mm. it's, it, uh, it's trial and error. I'm a mother. Mm. And I'm trying to raise my sons to understand that failure is a beautiful thing. Because mm. you do not know what it is that you know and can do mm -hmm. until you've rubbed up against the, the, the border of, of what is possible and what you, you know. So mm. pushing against that border is, is, is beautiful. And finding mm. ways to, to integrate failure into your life mm -hmm. and not have it crush you is, is a very yeah. good thing. Some of my biggest... Failures, I would agree. Some of my biggest failures are th times when I received a, a big rejection that I wasn't yeah. expecting have resulted in some kind of a breakthrough or a moment of, Absolutely. you know, chutzpah yeah. or something to, yeah. to push through that. Do you, do you work on multiple projects at once or are you a serial monogamist? Oh, no. I work on, no, yeah. no. I work on many projects at, at once. Uh, there's yeah. a project that I've been working on for uh, uh, 18 years mm. and it's just called Time. <laughs> it's time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and every, every, every time that I, I ha come across a beautiful mm. quote about time, it goes into time. Oh, wow. Uh, but I don't know what. It, maybe that's my black hole book because it cannot be written. Say. Everything gets sucked into it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it bends light. Uh, yeah, who knows? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I, I work on probably five. Um, the great, great Canadian poet and classicist Anne Carson oh, yeah. uh, actually has different stations in her mm. uh, study where she's working on different things. And I love that because what it means is when you get up and you go to work, mm -hmm. uh, the thing that has the most energy for you, the most um, heat and excitement is the thing you're going mm. to work on. Mm. And, and I think that that is wonderful because you always come to your work with with joy and yeah. thrill, and this kind of work can really get you down mm -hmm. uh, if you're stuck in the weeds and you're, you're mm -hmm. really doubting yourself. So always going toward the, the glee and the light and, the, and, and the, the, the happiness, that I think that's very helpful to keep doing it for yeah. a, a whole life. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the people behind can't hear as well as we can. Uh, going yeah. back to your writing process and the iterations of, of drafts and spaces in between, how do you know when you're done? 
Okay, so yes, this is this is the hardest part, right? Mm -hmm. um, there, you go into a work, and there is a platonic ideal, and that that sort of slowly comes into focus as you move through the drafts. And it, at first, it's just a glow; it's just something mm -hmm. toward which you're you're working. Mm -hmm. And then, as you you limit your possibilities by using words, right? By by using ideas which are limited in their scope, just necessarily. By, by uh, pinning your work to very specific characters within a very specific time and place and scenes. So suddenly things become less vague and far more um, concrete. And it's a, it's a constant process of taking what is abstract and turning it concrete and then turning it back into abstract <laughs> because words are abstractions. So I think eventually you get to the point where you come as close as you possibly can to the platonic ideal, and you're not able in your own perception of the work to change anything largely in order to get it to, to where you, you see the thing happening. That's when you give it to other people. And because other people have a, a different perspective necessarily, and they're able to tell you where you've gone wrong or where you can change it or where you can make it even finer, better, even better, smarter, more complicated, more, more rich. And I think the, the point where you finally say, okay, this is as close as I possibly can get it, is the po point where you um, have basically given up on being a per perfect person, right? <laughs> uh, like I said, even Shakespeare is not perfect, uh, not always, and that's that's good to remember. So, um, and then it, it goes through a very, very long process of, of further winnowing in other people's hands and with other people's sensibilities impressed upon it. Thank goodness, right? Thank goodness you have a lot of other readers in the world who are able to tell you where you steer things wrong. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, for me it's usually the point where it's as close as I can make it, maybe, knowing that I have failed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One doesn't really want to end on that. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> one no, more question. No, we, like, we like failure. <laughs> Is there a microphone somewhere near? Okay. Hildegard. Have you studied Hildegard? Oh, sure. Oh, Hildegard. Yeah. She is my absolute favorite mystic. I got, so um, the question was if I studied Hildegard von Bingen, and she was this, this German mystic of the time. Um, and I love her desperately. She, I, I listen to her music constantly. She's this polymath. Um, she, she changed music. She wrote a medicinal treatise that was used for 400 years after her death. She, she got visions from God, and she was such a genius in every single way. She was able to take these abstractions and make them concrete, to actually push into the world and, and make her power radiate outward in an, an extraordinary way. So th uh, through her visions, she got donations to build her own abbey. She got, um, she started to become the, the, um, the person that popes and kings would write to for, for advice. Like, she's my favorite. I love yeah. her so much. In fact, um, I, the pandemic actually stopped it, but I had a, um, uh, a huge launch party in Gainesville plans, which I had to cancel, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I bought um, a, a little cookie maker on Etsy, where it was like, actually, it was custom made of Hildegard. I was gonna make a lot of, like, 400 cookies of Hildegard. Just, it's the ultimate, you know, so PR move to the whole neighborhood. What's this, what does this cookie mean? Let me tell you. A cookie, yes. Oh, yeah. that's so terrific. Yeah. There are going to be books out in the lobby. Um, that you can get signed. Mm -hmm. So please do so, and thank you so, so much. It's been really thank fun. You.